Let the church say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We are again thankful to God for being here in his presence. We thank God for the great blessings that he has bestowed upon us. We may be able to stand here in the sanctuary to be prepared to pray and ask God's blessings upon us. We have in my hand here over 200 names of people who have placed their name on the prayer list. We cannot read them all, obviously, but we know that God knows who they are. I want you to pray for the names on this prayer list, that the Lord will bless them. But I do want to, you to remember uh, Sister Esther Miles. Sister Miles is one of the founding members of this church. She became a member of this church 58 years ago. And I want you to remember her in prayer. We know that God is going to bless her and he's going to strengthen her. I want you to remember these in the hospital, Rachel Hudson, Shirlene Farrell, Foster McCass, Mamie Barnett, Charlie Williams, Esther Miles, Erica Woods, Maddie Cooper, and Philip Perkins. Brother Perkins is another one of our members. Now, this young man, uh, Foster McGall, he is, uh, I think he was wounded, in, I think it was, uh, he was shot or something like that. Yes. His name is Charles Williams. His name is Charles Williams. We want you to pray for him that God will bless him and the Lord will stretch forth his hand and touch him. And I'm going to ask uh, Minister Nathan Brown to come at this time and lead us uh, to the throne of grace. Hallelujah. Let us all pray. Righteous Father, in the name of Jesus, we come once again, Lord, to this place of worship. We come with thanksgiving. We come with praise. We come to tell you, God, that you are a good God. Yes, you are. We thank you just for the opportunity to come to lift our voice, thanking you for your goodness and your tender mercy, your compassions that fail not, knowing, oh God, that they are new every morning. Hallelujah and great is thy faithfulness. God, we come now putting thy petition before thee. We are asking you to bless this service in a special way. Bless our endeavor in everything, everything that we do to glorify thy name. We are asking you to continue bless our building program and bless all the things that we are doing, Lord, to prosper and to succeed in you even as our soul prosper. God Almighty, we are asking your blessing upon those that are sick and afflicted. We commend the sickness in your care, Lord Jesus. We are asking a special prayer for Sister Esther Myers. Lord, you know her need and we are asking now that you move by your spirit in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you to touch, heal, deliver, even restore to our health and all those that have need of, we ask, Lord Jesus, that you will be a burden bearer for them and in whatever the needs might be, you will supply such. Lord, we ask that you bless this great congregation. Bless us individually and collectively. Remember those that come seeking salvation this day. Send forth your word in the name of Jesus. Touch, heal, and deliver. Let someone ask the question, what shall I do to be saved? We ask also that you remember but those that are viewing our telecast. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you send forth your word, Lord, in the demonstration of your spirit and power, that your knowledge be revealed to them, and they will come to a closer knowledge and understanding of your will. Bless the choir as they minister. Bless the usher as they usher up and down these aisles. Bless every functional auxiliary in this church. And most of all, remember the man of God. Continue to endow him with divine wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Undergird him with your strength, that he will carry out the great work that you have given him to do and in all things Lord God we are going to praise you we are going to glorify you and we are going to honor your name forever we ask these blessings now in Jesus name amen, amen. our scripture reading for today is found in the book of Philippians chapter 4 verse number 13 will the congregation please repeat after me I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me Amen. Amen.
everybody.
I'm very glad that I heard the choir sing that song on Calvary because it is something that is always close and very near and dear to my heart that which Jesus did for us there at Calvary. I am not going to uh, spend a lot of time on introductions. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Revelations chapter 1. I want, to, I want to go over again a sermon that I preached some time ago. I want to go back again because I believe that what I'm going to talk about today has a great deal of importance in all of our lives and very often hinders us from being the best we can be. My subject this morning is mastery over fear. And I want to talk a little bit about the resurrection too. And I think that too often we wait until Easter before we say anything about the resurrection. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the very foundation stone of Christianity. If Christ be not risen, we are still in our sins. And all of those who died in Christ have perished. Those are the words of the Apostle Paul. But Christ has risen from the dead, and he has become the first fruits of them that slept. I hope that the Lord will touch somebody's heart today who is not saved, who want to be saved, that they will come forward. At the proper time, we got water in the pool and someone to baptize. We don't wait until next week or next month or every six months or every first Sunday. Uh, we do it immediately because we believe that is the way they did it in the uh, early church. Mastery over fear. Those of you who may be joining with us on television this morning, it is my hope that the, this sermon will be of a blessing to you. I want to take this opportunity to invite you to our services whenever you get an opportunity. You will find the door open and the welcome mat uh, laid out for you. And I do hope that what we say today will be a source of inspiration to you. In the first chapter of the book of Revelations, chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, uh, John is recounting a great vision that he had on the Isle of Patmos. Just a brief comment on that. This man was the only apostle to die a natural death. All of the other apostles were beheaded. They were put to death by the Roman uh, Empire. Uh, they tried to kill this man. Tradition tells us that they boiled him in oil. But he was miraculously delivered by God and he was banished to an island called Patmos. And John is writing here in his, 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 his uh, the event that occurred uh, on this island. The Lord Jesus appeared to him. He saw him in the midst of the golden candlesticks, clothed with a garment down to his foot. He said he heard a voice. There was a voice of many waters. Verse 17 says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen and have the keys of hell and of death. Fear not is the thought that I want to bring to you this morning. Since the dawn of history, men and women have responded to death with that Job-like cry, if a man die, shall he live again? Someone asked Plato, the Greek philosopher, shall we live again 
And Plato's answer was, I hope so. Since the beginning of time, the graves of the dead lie silent with his occupants. The tombs of great men, Alexander, Napoleon, Moses, Muhammad, Buddha, hold these men in a vice-like grip. But at this point, this time, today, let us think together about Jesus because the tomb of Jesus is empty. It is his resurrection that secures for us our eternal salvation. I use the word eternal advisedly. And I say eternal because it is my hope that everybody understands what eternal means. Unfortunately, some of my colleagues don't. They confuse the word eternal with temporary. The resurrection is the central theme of the Christian religion. The cross is the insignia of Christianity. But even the cross without the resurrection would only mean that Jesus had been assassinated and rejected by men and put to death in a very cruel and grisly fashion. But it is by the resurrection that Christ is declared to be the Son of God with power. For the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans and said that he was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of them from the dead. It is by the resurrection that his atoning sacrifice is accepted by God. It is by the resurrection that we see that God has placed his approval upon the work of Jesus Christ and what he did on Calvary. And on this island of Patmos, Jesus appears to John and he appears to him in resplendent glory. And he says to him, fear not. I am the living one. I was dead. I don't think we understand that word too. I think, I think, the death of Christ has become hackneyed, for the use of a better word. We've heard it so often that it sort of bounces off of us like a ball against a wall. And we have not fully come to grips with what dead means. We have an understanding of it, but we have not fully come to grips with it. So much so that we like to deny death even when it's in our midst. How often have I heard ministers at funerals in an effort to ease the burden and the bereavement of the family? How often have I said, as he looked down on a casket of a dead person, say, he is not dead. And everybody says, amen. Although we all know that the person is dead. I understand what the individual is trying to get at. We abhor death so much that we try by the way we do in funerals to exorcise it out of our minds. We have made the person who is dead to appear as if he is alive and asleep. Too often people come to the uh, beer and say, oh, doesn't he look just like he was sleeping? That's the purpose of it. Do not give the idea that a person is dead. We have the beautiful flowers everywhere. It brings to my mind the, the story of the old lady who when they got to the grave and they laid the flowers out all over the grave, the, the old mother uh, went to her big basket yeah. and approached the grave and began to lay out the things that the man loved while he was alive. She laid out some greens and cornbread chitterlings, yellow yam potatoes. The people were astounded. They took the mother back and said, what are you doing? Mother said, mother said well, he loved this food. 
They said, Mother, he's gone now. And Mother said, if he can smell these flowers. <laughs> he can eat this food here. <laughs> when you're gone, you're gone. When you're dead, you're dead. I, I said that because Jesus was dead. He didn't swoon. He did not faint. He was dead. Life was gone from his body. I don't understand. I, as I said this morning in, in, uh, in the first service, uh, I, I saw a, a dead body. When I was in St. Louis uh, at the morgue, uh, at the home of Phillips Hospital. This was much, it was more than a dead body. It was what we call a cadaver. And uh, the students had been working on that body. It did not, it didn't look good at all because the rib cage was open, the muscles were exposed, the sinews were exposed, the stomach had been cut right down the middle. I sat there and I watched that cadaver, it come to my mind that this person at one time was a living, laughing, crying, walking human being, but now he's a piece of meat, gone, dead. Jesus was dead. They took him down, he was dead. There was no life in him at all. Jesus said, I am the living one. I was dead, but I am alive forevermore. <laughs> fear not. John was stricken with fear, but Jesus said, fear not. This emotion called fear is a problem that many people have to deal with. We have fear of all kinds. Fear of the past, fear of the future. We're afraid of poverty, fear of illness, death. No matter who you are, rich or poor, high or low, young or old, educated or ignorant, it makes no difference. It touches all classes. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you that fear is a stressful, debilitating emotion. Fear will chain you to such a degree that you will be afraid to change one job for a better job. Fear will keep you locked in to your place where when you are offered a promotion, it will keep you from accepting that challenge because you are afraid you will not succeed. And it is in this context that I speak to you this morning. Because there are so many people who want to receive Christ. They want to walk with God. They want their lives changed radically. They know all about churches. They've been church members all for a long time. But that has not affected their life. They have made all kinds of resolutions. And these resolutions have never lasted. They have tried to make changes and they have always failed. And when the opportunity comes for them to really step out on Christ and to really be born again, they are nailed to their pews because they are afraid of what their friends might say. They are afraid of what the world might say. But I got some news for you, ladies and gentlemen. I don't believe that any man who loves the Lord Jesus Christ ought to be afraid of what the world has to say because the world is not afraid to do their thing. I'm reminded of this dreadful occurrence that just took place this week, I believe. America is a place where we want freedom of expression. And I'm in favor of that because were it not for freedom of expression, probably I would not be able to preach like I'm preaching this morning. I'm in favor of it. But because I'm in favor of freedom of expression doesn't mean that I favor everything that people express. Amen. And I am appalled, devastated, by the use of taxpayer dollars in the name of art. Now, people can do whatever they want to do with their own money. You can find whatever you want to finance, fine. But when you take God-fearing people's money and support an artist who made a crucifix of the Lord Jesus Christ, filled up a jar with his own urine and put the crucifix in it and sent it to a museum to be on display, I think we've gone too far.
it is not appropriate at this point for me to tell you what the title of, what the title was of that display in that museum. It would be inappropriate for me to do so at this time. But the man who did that and the people who, who, who enjoy looking at it are not ashamed of it. It's amazing how many people are ashamed to walk around with a Bible in their hand. They're not ashamed to walk around with penthouse or hustler. But when a Bible comes down to a Bible, we stick, a, we stick the Bible in a case, put it up under a newspaper, put it up under our coat, whatever. Come fear. Don't be afraid to do what you know is right. Not only in relationship to receiving Christ, but in relationship to what you do in life. Sometimes you go out on a new job, you want to work hard, you want to do good, you're getting paid a good salary, you want to deliver, but they got a whole lot of folk around you who've been riding on the boss. They've been coming in late and having somebody else punch that car. They've been going off hiding and said, don't tell the boss where I am. When you come on the job, you start working real hard, doing a good job, giving them eight hours a day for eight hours pay, they get mad at you. They say, you're making it hard for us. You start doing what they're doing because you're afraid of what they're going to say. When you go out on these jobs, give your best. The people who give less are the people who, get, who do not get promoted, and they are the people who get fired when layoff time comes. Do what you can. Do your best. Look ahead. Be successful. Don't be a, medi don't be a mediocre person. Don't be satisfied with the with mediocrity. Anybody can be mediocre. Anybody can just get along. But it takes somebody with courage. It takes somebody with strength to roll upstream. Anybody can go downstream. Hear not? I am the living one. Are you afraid to begin a new life in Christ? Are you afraid that someone will tell you, no, don't do that because you won't be able to make it stick? I don't think if I was you, I wouldn't join those churches because you know you're just going there six months later, you're going to be right back out here with us. That's what they tell you. But Jesus said, if you had the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move. Now, you got to understand the context of what Jesus was saying. See, we, we forget, we fail to recognize sometimes that Jesus spoke in idiomatic terms. Idioms do not necessarily mean literalization. We speak idiomatic all the time. I'm going by and pick John up. We know what that means. You're going to drive by in the car, put John in the car, and bring him here. But you didn't say he was going to do that. You said he was going to go pick him up. If I was from Mars, I would swear he was going over there and pick him up. Idioms are all over the place. Jesus said, if you had the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this fountain, be thou removed. Now, Jesus was not talking about the great mountains of Judea. No one has ever been able to move uh, Mount uh, uh, Horeb. No one uh, uh, tried uh, to move Sinai. And I don't know of any man, I don't care how much faith he had, and I heard a whole lot of men talking about a whole lot of faith, but no one has said to Mount Everest, move, and Mount Everest did anything. Jesus was not trying to get us to try to go out and talk to natural mountains and get them to move. But ladies and gentlemen, we got some spiritual mountains that's choking us down. We got some spiritual mountains that are destroying us and sapping our strength and making us to be nothing but, but mediocre people. But Jesus said, no matter what the mountain is, it may be a mountain of frustration. It may be a mountain of depression. It may be a mountain of fear. But Jesus said, and if you had the faith of a, of a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain of fear, this mountain of depression, this mountain of joblessness, this mountain of hunger, this mountain of family problems, this mountain of all around you. He said you can say to this mountain and it'll move. I believe it will. Paul caught that. He said, I can do all things through Christ. That strengthens me. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, listen. The word of God is so filled with inspiration that none of us need to fear of failure at all. I do not fear failure. I do not fear those things that some people say will destroy you. I believe that if we'll step out on God's word and believe in him, nothing will be too hard for us. Amen. 
God spoke to the prophet Isaiah and said these words to a people who felt as if they were surrounded by the enemies and were going down. He said, hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainted not? Neither is weary. Somebody said, I'm tired of asking God for things. Doesn't God get tired of hearing me? He never gets tired. He said, well, Reverend, I just prayed to him yesterday and, and, and I didn't get what I wanted, but I'm afraid to pray again. Pray again, brother. He said, well, Reverend, I just prayed this morning and it's just noonday. Pray again, brother. He said, well, Reverend, I prayed three or four times and I'm afraid to pray. Pray again. Somebody said, well, doesn't the Bible say that that's what you call vain uh, prayers? No, it does not mean that at all. It doesn't mean that I get on my knees and ask God, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. It means that I pray and ask God this day. If it don't come today, I pray and ask him tomorrow. If it don't come tomorrow, I pray and ask him the next day. If the woman who went before the unjust judge and bothered him to such a degree that he heard what she asked, how much more shall your heavenly father give you those things if you're asking for them? Don't be afraid to ask God. Don't be afraid to ask him. Don't be afraid to pray. Our God is nothing, neither faints nor is weary. But here's something else that Isaiah said. He gives power to the faint because we do faint. And to them that have no might, he increased his strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And young men shall utterly fall, but. That word but's a big word. It's a word of contrast. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run. Not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Many of us start out in life with high hopes and lofty dreams which are never realized. And the passing years bring bitter disappointment. And when the first blush of enthusiasm dies down and the bloom is off the rose and when the radiance has gone out of our dreams, God keeps us moving on. In life, it's like a roller coaster, brothers and sisters. Sometimes we are soaring like eagles. Sometimes we are running on a fast track. But sometimes we're just trudging along. Sometimes we're on the mountain peaks, enjoying life in all of its fullness. And sometimes we're in the valley of gloom and despair. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And I'm thankful because I know God knows my problem. I know that he knows my needs. And I'm not afraid of what tomorrow will bring. Because I know whatever tomorrow brings, God has given me the victory today. I've got it already. Anytime you go into the examination room, you've got the victory before you go in. Because if you don't know the answers before you go in, you will not know the answers when you get in. I've got the victory now. Why? Because Jesus is the good shepherd. He said, I know my sheep and I am known of mine. And I'm so glad that he knows his flock. He knows them personally. He knows who they are. He knows where they're going. He knows where they came from. He knows their uprising. He, down, he knows their down cities. He knows our sins. And he forgives them. He is fully aware of the diseases that afflict our bodies. And he heals them. He knows our needs, ladies and gentlemen. And he supplies each and every one. He understands our fears. 
and he ameliorates them. He eases them. He knows our wanderings, how we wander far away. But he knows how to recover us. He knows our prayers, ladies and gentlemen, before we pray them. And he knows how to answer them. There is nothing too hard for him. And everything you need to be and everything you want to be, you'll find in Christ. And you do not have to fear. Sometimes people are afraid of crowds. They say, I want to be saved, but it's too crowded. When do you want to be saved? You want to come when there's nobody here? Do you want to come to Jesus like Nicodemus, uh, like uh, by night? Do you don't want anyone to know that you've stepped out on the power of God? Ladies and gentlemen, do not be afraid. And do not be afraid of the future. Let's always know that when you step out on God, when you believe in Christ, he will be the answer to every problem that you ever had. You may be down and out today, but God will raise you up. You may be afflicted with some kind of mean and dirt, low, low down and dirty habit, but God is able to take it away. You may be a person uh, who has been walking backwards, but God is able to cause you to go forward. He can pick you up and turn you around and make your life worth living. You may say well, life is not worth living. It's the same thing every day. That's because you don't have the joy of the Lord in your life. When Jesus is in your life, you wake up happy. When Jesus is in your life, uh, you go home, you go to your job uh, with joy down in your soul. When you get there, you know uh, that he is on your side. Uh, I don't care who you are. You may be in the highest levels. Uh, you may be a banker, a lawyer, a representative. Uh, uh, you may be a, a maid. You may be a washerwoman. Uh, you may be some man who is shoveling coal. Uh, but no matter the difference, how high you are, how low you may be, he will be there in the valley on the mountaintop. I'm glad I know him. I'm glad I found him when I did. I'm glad that when the uh, sunshine of life begins to dim, when I be going down, I'm going down on the other side of the mountain and coming to that far horizon where I know that I must close my eyes in death. I have no fear because the Lord is with me. The psalmist said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I'm glad I know him, because he said, I anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely, not maybe, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Fear not. I am he who was dead, but I am alive forevermore, said Jesus. And I have the keys of death and hell. Jesus is your savior. He died that you might live. I'm through. If there's a man or woman here today, that wants to be saved. There's a man or woman here today who's ready to give themselves to Christ. I want you to rise from your seat right now. Our baptismal committee is here. I want you to rise and walk down these aisles. If you're here now, will you come? As our choir sings, I'm coming down to meet you. Hallelujah. My friend, God bless you there, young lady. Come right on down. God bless you there, my brother. There's another right there. God bless you right there. This is your day. This is your hour. As our choir sings, the Lord is talking to you and to you and to you and to you and to you. And to you. you ought to rise from your seat now. God bless you, young lady. This is your day. Where are you, my friends? Hallelujah. We are waiting for you. We are waiting for you. Don't let the devil turn you around. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Hallelujah. 
here to meet you. I'm down here to take you by the hand and walk with you. All you need to do is just to stand where you are. Sometimes we're afraid to go by ourselves, but that's why I'm in this aisle. Where are you, my friend? The Lord is speaking to you and to you. Do you have some doubts? Do you have fears? Don't let them hold you back. Don't let them hold you back. We're getting ready to close, but we don't want to close without you. Don't let us close without you. The Lord is talking to someone else. Will you come? God bless you, young lady. Don't let us close without you. The Lord's talking to you. He's talking directly to you. Not to your neighbor, but to you. Where are you? God bless you, my brother. Where are you, my friend? We are closing now, but we don't want to close without you. And the Lord is talking to you. Come on.
time has come for prayer. We're going to ask the congregation to stand. We can't get near the altar because there is no room. But stand where you are. We're going to ask God blessings upon you. We're going to ask Elder McGee to come and lead us to the throne of grace. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, in the person of thy Son, Jesus Christ, we come to thee again giving thanks. We thank thee, Lord, for these who stand in faith, believing that your prayer, that our prayer is heard by thee, and that thou would give to the here, Lord God, yes. the need that they seek you. To the sick, we ask you, Lord God, trust their bodies. Give them strength and deliverance. Those present and those listening over the TV, Lord God, in the hospitals, go with them and give them Father, deliverance. Pray, in Lord, the name of Jesus, to, Lord, she takes to the troubled child. in mind, bring peace, O oh, Lord God. God. To the distressed ones, Lord God, God, God. Carry, let them Lord. know that in you, Lord, Lord God, there's hope God. and deliverance if they would just turn Lord. to Jesus. Lord, in thy Father, name we pray, Lord. 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 Look upon us, we pray thee. Give us the victory in every situation. Go into that prison, touch the hearts and the mind. May they use that time aright. Bless us in every respect, O Lord God. And we give honor to your name, for we know in the name of Jesus is victory. In the name of Jesus is deliverance. In the name of Jesus is keeping power. To thee we give thanks for everything in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.